So thank you guys so much for joining our, our 201 session today. Let's start with some of the quick pointers we covered while we were just waiting to, to hop in and get settled. Um, let's talk about getting some data into Clipfolio. So this is a trading account that we've got here. Um, there's a ton of content in this account. A lot of the data is uh, a little bit fictional or just data we were experimenting with. But if we imagine that we were starting fresh and maybe we have a new blank dashboard that we can start with, um, like a few of our attendees have raised, the first the first question we want to tackle is how to get our data into Clipfolio. So I'm going to navigate over to the library, and I'm going to click on the data sources section. Now, this is a demo account, so, so the library is where we house all of our content in Clipfolio. Right now, we're looking at all of the individual data sources that we've created over time. Lots and lots of them. You can see 160 pages worth. So there's probably some cleanup to be done. But if you're starting fresh, you're probably not going to see very much in this section. What you're going to want to do is create a new data source. So think of Clipfolio as the front end visualization tool to whatever data is relevant to your business. Um, we can showcase that data. We can, we can highlight it in a bar graph or a pie chart or a gauge to help you understand how you're performing against certain metrics. Um, but there's two sort of pieces to Clipfolio that I find it helpful to, to articulate. Um, the first part is the, the visualization of that data, the front end display. And that's what we're handling in Clipfolio. The second piece, and probably the much more important piece, is the underlying data. And I, I generally explain to, when I'm speaking with a customer maybe for the first time, uh, if you have access to the data you want to visualize, there are virtually no limits to how you can showcase it in, into Clipfolio. Um, but we do want to think about and tackle that problem. How do we get access to the data we want to work with? So I have navigated over to our library, and we want to create a new data source. So let's first look at some of these options over here at the top right. Um, these are what we call our, our core connectors. These are generic ways of getting data into Clipfolio, regardless of what service you're using. So the simplest way is to upload a file. I can upload an Excel file, CSV, XML, JSON. I can just browse my system and upload whatever file I'm interested in. So this is a great route to take if you are experimenting. Um, if you just want to pop some data into the system and play around with it, definitely upload a file. However, if, if you know that the key business data you want to work with resides in Excel, then this is not a scalable long-term approach. Um, and the reason is this. We want to make a dashboard live. We want to make it so you build out your content, uh, and, and whenever your data updates, whenever new data comes into your file, we want that to automatically be reflected on the dashboard. But if you're just uploading a file, you're not making a live connection. You're making just a one-time connection. You're uploading that file as it is at that moment, and, and nothing you do to that file on your local system is ever going to reflect in the dashboard. So if your data is in Excel, let's talk about a few scalable ways you can get that data into Clipfolio. There are three services that we integrate with. Box.com is one of them, Dropbox, and Google Drive. All of these are cloud storage platforms. Um, and if you're sort of an, uh, uh, adverse to storing some of your, your confidential data in a service like that, no issues, totally understand. Um, an FTP server is a good route for you guys to take. All of these options will allow you to make a live connection, a handshake connection between Clipfolio and that service, and by extension, between Clipfolio and the version of your Excel file that is stored in that service, so the version of my file that's stored in Drive, or in my FTP server, and, and that live connection can update over time. So if you're storing your key spreadsheet in Dropbox, for example, uh, we're going to make a live connection to your instance of Dropbox. Anytime your Excel file is updated, those changes are going to sync to the Dropbox cloud, and then in turn, sync directly to Clipfolio. So if your data is in Excel, this is a scalable long-term approach, and we have many, many customers taking this route. Let me know if you have any questions on that. One, one question here from, from uh, George or, or Jorge. Um, 
I'm interested in uh, the MailChimp integration. Awesome, great question. So we'll talk about a few things around MailChimp. We've got some great pre-built content to cover. Um, and if you have something else in mind, I'll, hopefully I'll be able to point you in the right direction to get some, some good help. Um, but overcoming that initial hurdle, if your data is in Excel, just sort of understanding why you shouldn't be uploading it directly and, and instead working with something like Dropbox um, is just a, a good thing to think about and it'll make your working portfolio much, much easier. On that topic, one of my favorite support resources are some of the playlists we have on our YouTube channel. So if I navigate over to, that gets me every time. If we navigate over to our YouTube channel, and I will send you guys the link here in the chat menu, um, check out the playlist section. And let me point you to a really, really good playlist around working with data in Excel. It's this one right here, Clipfolio Dashboard Tutorials for Excel. Um, and you want this, this playlist right here with nine videos. There's a slightly older one just before it, but this playlist is awesome. One of our colleagues on the marketing side put this together, um, and he just takes you end-to-end -end around uh, some elements of planning, some elements of getting your data in, building a little bit of content, a few tutorials, really, really great playlist. All the videos are nice and short, um, so I, I highly recommend it. Let me send you this link as well. Cool, so let's do this. Um, so I am, I, I will be a uh, fictional organization. I've just started with Clipfolio. My data is in Excel, and we are a Google Apps house internally. So what I've done is I've stored my, my key spreadsheet that all my colleagues are collaborating on in Google Drive. So I want to create a new data source and link up that file. So the first thing I'm going to do is I've navigated to the create a new data source screen in Clipfolio. I'm going to scroll down a little bit and I'm going to choose Google Drive as the service I want to work with. And I'm going to create a custom data source with Google Drive. Um, a, a quick note on what you're seeing in this screen here. Whenever you choose a specific service, and Google Drive is not a good example of this, um, but a lot of the services we integrate with require you to write an API query to pull in a set of data. You see a light blue box and a dark blue box. What we're trying to do in the light blue box is make things a little bit easier for you. So for a lot of these services, the light blue box will, will show you some pre-built API queries. Um, we're just trying to make your life a little bit easier. Google Drive, the connection does, does not have that level of complexity, so there's not much advantage over here. These two, I think, are going to show me pretty much the same thing. Uh, but what I want to do, essentially, is connect to my Google Drive account. So if I was a brand new user, uh, I would see this connect a new account button. And what I want to do is authorize Clipfolio to access some of the data in my drive. Uh, we take security very, very seriously. So what I'm doing here is I am um, I'm, I'm granting the, the permissions that are required from Google to accomplish this workflow. So I'm, I'm signing in with my username and password. Um, the only data that I'm, I'm granting Clipfolio the access to is the specific file that I'm going to choose on this next screen. So we're by no means syncing all of the data in Google Drive. Uh, instead, we're, we're just going to pull over whatever file I choose that I want to work. Um, security is a, is a really, really important topic. Um, we take it seriously too, so if, if that's important to you and if you want to go a little bit deeper on it, um, you'll get my contact info in a follow-up email. Let me know and we're happy to, uh, to have that discussion or maybe loop in the right colleague on our side to, to help um, alleviate any concerns that, that your team might have. So I have connected to my Google Drive. I'm now seeing all the folders and all the files that are located in my drive. Um, and again, you know, what I'm trying to get to is store your Excel spreadsheet in a service like Drive or Dropbox or Box and select it in a mechanism like this. So I'm just going to choose this file right here. And what this is going to allow me to do is make a live connection to this data instead of a one-time connection. So I have chosen the file I want to work with. This is some data that I, um, I scrubbed from uh, 
the Hockey Hockey Hall of Fame or all-time uh, NHL scoring leaders, just some, some data that will allow us to play around a little bit. Uh, so I get to verify that this is the actual data that I want to work with, and I'm going to continue. And this screen right here is, is really important. So what I'm doing is I'm finalizing the handshake connection between Clipfolio and the specific file that I'm hoping to work with. This Q for refresh button allows me to say that I want Clipfolio to reach back out to this file every minute, every five minutes, every 24 hours, uh, what, however often I need, and pull in the newest version of that data. Yeah, Canadians in hockey, I, I hear you. Um, so guilty, maybe I, should, maybe I should pull in a different sport or one of our colleagues is a little bit of a car, uh, a car fanatic, so he's got some good uh, data on Mercedes that was on my screen a couple minutes ago, but I hear you, very, very fair. Um, so I'm making a live connection to this data and this is exactly what we want uh, because now any dashboards that I create with this file are automatically going to update every 24 hours with, uh, with any new information that becomes available. Uh, this is what we want. It's sort of that, that set it and forget it, if you remember that infomercial. Um, we don't want to have to upload a file ever manually. We, we want to eliminate any manual workflows. Um, and working with these services like Drive or Dropbox or Box or an FTP server um, enables that. Cool, so, so some good comments about my hockey spreadsheet, but what do you guys think so far? Um, any questions coming to mind on this? I've now finalized this handshake, um, and this file is now going to live in Clipfolio as what we call a data source. So what I can do now, uh, I've, I've, I've now tackled the first hurdle. I've made my data accessible to the platform. What I can do now is go and build a clip with it. And that's this orange button I see over here at the top, right? Perfect. So when I choose to build a clip with this data source, um, what I'm seeing here are a number of different visual options. Now, it doesn't really matter what I pick on this screen, but I'll walk you through it really quickly. Um, we support all of the standard visualization types in Clipfolio, bar charts, tables, pie charts, gauges. Um, there are a few that are, are especially useful. I love this value pair which sort of has a larger number and then a, a, a smaller number, or a larger figure and a smaller figure, really good for comparing maybe this week's revenue with last week's revenue, or two numbers that are, that are closely related. A table is a great, very space efficient way to showcase a lot of data in a tight space. So are these little mini charts. Uh, these mini charts can actually, you can use them inside a table, very, very space efficient way. Um, I find, uh, uh, two, two chart types that are really good to experiment with are the bar chart and the table. So if you're just starting out, actually a table is a really nice way to operate because uh, you can just see exactly what's happening every step of the way. So stop me guys anytime if questions are coming to mind, but otherwise um, this screen is a really, really important one. So I usually spend a good amount of time in here. This is what we call our clip editor screen. So, so tell me, with, who on the line has has found themselves in this screen before? Um, have you gotten this far, or, or were you sticking more to the, the pre-built content? Awesome. Okay. So you found the editor screen and working with the pre-built. Um, so, so, you know, maybe we'll do this. I will run through what I think is important on this screen and, and some of the pieces that I think tend to get missed by some new users. But I, I want to make sure this is relevant to you guys. So stop me if um, it's redundant or if it's too simple and we'll, we'll move on. So the clip editor is really where the magic happens in Clipfolio. This is, I think, what sets us apart from a lot of the other players in this space. Um, we've got some of that great pre-built content. We haven't talked about it today, but Alvin, you said you found it. And, you know, it's a huge part of our platform. So I think any new customer finds that pre-built content right away. Um, but the ability to build custom content uh, and, and mash up data from various different data sources, include engagement elements on your dashboard, like a, a pick list or a date filter. Um, that, that power and flexibility, I think this is a huge piece of what sets Clipfolio apart from a lot of the other players in this space. So a lot of magic happening in this screen. I mentioned, so on that previous screen, I chose that I was going to build a table. 
Um, so here we see our, our table, uh, a preview of what our table could look like. But I mentioned that that selection doesn't really matter, um, and here's why. So over at the top right, I see I've got two buttons. I've got this little plus minus button, um, and that's what I've clicked on right now. So what we're seeing over here is a contextual menu. So because I've chosen to build a table, this plus minus is showing me a contextual, uh, uh, contextual uh, little button uh, based on a table. So I can add columns, I can remove columns, I can move my columns around left and right. Um, and whatever type of chart you're working on, this little plus minus button will give you some, some options specific to that. This other button right above it with a few small symbols, a letter A, pie chart, and so on, if I click this, this, is, this exposes our components palette. Uh, so this shows us all of the other visual display choices that we have access to. So even though I've chosen to build a table originally, if I change my mind and choose that I want a pie chart, I can click and drag anything, pull it into the middle, and I now have multiple different elements in my visual. We call these, these visualizations clips. Um, a really nice option that I, that I see over here is what we call our layout grid. So if I pull this into the middle, this basically gives me a variety of a number of independent workspaces, um, in, individual little cells. I can create more columns, uh, more rows, and this basically allows me to just lay out my visualization however I need. Maybe I want a pie chart towards the top. Um, if I choose this layout button, Maybe I want our pie chart to occupy a certain amount of columns and rows in our layout grid. Um, and our table can occupy a different section. So the layout grid is a really nice option just to let you design and build your chart um, in, a, in a way that makes the most sense visually. You should always showcase your data in the way that makes the most sense. So let's see what else is happening here. Um, this section up at the top left, I like to think of this as our table of contents. So this shows us all the individual elements of our chart um, and the sub-elements. So I brought in a pie chart. If I click on that, I see our pie chart becomes highlighted. A pie chart has these sub-elements too, values and labels. Uh, labels are what's going to be in my legend. Values are the slices of my pie. So my table of contents is showing me all the individual pieces of my chart. And any time I add in a new element, let's say like a bar chart, I see that new element become visible in my table of contents here. So let's clean this up a little bit and we'll see if we can build a quick example. So if I right click on this layout grid, I see a few options. I just want to remove this and tidy things up a little bit. Perfect. So now we're left with just a bar chart. Um, now, every element of your chart, and, and this, we're not going to really be able to do much with it quite yet, but every element of your clip is going to have its own properties menu. And this is where we can change loads of visual display options. Um, so remember this just for now. We'll come back to it a little bit later and see how we can optimize how our, our bar chart ends up looking. Uh, for now, I'm going to go over to the data tab. Uh, that's where we will always see our data and we can choose whatever data we want to showcase. So on a bar chart, I always start with the x-axis. Um, I have the ability to simply click and drag and select a few different cells, and those cells will automatically appear on our chart. So I've said right now, I just want to choose these five cells or these ten cells, and I can see right away they're automatically on my chart, uh, appearing on the x-axis. Maybe then for my series, uh, that those are going to be our bars, Maybe I want to I want to call out the total number of games played by each of these positions, and maybe my x-axis instead of the positions, maybe I should actually make this players. So here I can see the total number of games played by each of these players, and and right away that data becomes highlighted on our chart, um, and it it's it's sort of immediately brought to life. Some of the visual elements that I might want to change, maybe to make this a little more readable would be, uh, if I navigate over to the properties menu, maybe I want to show these x-axis labels on a little bit of an angle. Maybe that's easier for our users to read. 
uh, on our series, we might want to do something. I don't think we would, but maybe we want to show this as a line instead of a bar. I don't think it really fits in this case, but in a lot of cases, a line will make the most sense. Um, we can easily change that display option, and then everything about how our line looks. Perfect. So let's go back to bars. One thing I, I really like to do sometimes is if we navigate over to our bar line chart, so the top level of our chart, I can flip this on its side. So I want to switch the position of the X and Y axis and just showcase this data like this. I think visually um, that might be a better way to showcase this data. It just makes it easier to see just how many games uh, Gordy Howe played than Wayne Gretzky. Um, so any questions I'm, I'm happy to field, but let's, um, let's uh, up the level of complexity a little bit. So. I'm going to remove this formula that we started with and go back to a clean start. So what I did originally was I just selected a specific number of cells. And even though those, um, those populate immediately on the dashboard, that's not a best practice. Um, we, we generally recommend against just selecting a few different cells. Instead, we would usually recommend you choose the entire column worth of data. So choose all of column C, and then use some of the filtering options in Clipfolio to pare the selection down. Um, and the reason we do that is this. So if I just say I want these cells, if I just say I want cells C2 to C6, uh, I've hard-coded that selection to only ever show me these five cells. If any new data comes in at the bottom, even if today I go and choose you know, even if I chose every cell that was in my spreadsheet today, uh, what happens tomorrow when the data refreshes and 50 new cells appear at the bottom? Um, if I've hard-coded it, like I have here, that new data isn't automatically getting picked up. So for that reason, we usually recommend choosing the entire column. That means that we're always going to be taking every piece of data in column C, uh, even if new data comes in tomorrow or the next day, it's automatically picked up. And that's what you want to try to try to accomplish. So we've chosen all this data. Um, it looks a little bit a little bit hairy on our chart here. Uh, so we've probably got some cleanup to do. A real best practice is to use this little lightning bolt button, or there's a keyboard shortcut. So Alt A on Windows or Option A on a Mac. Uh, I want to evaluate this data. Um, what this does is it just shows me exactly what data I'm working with, and I do this constantly. I always want to know every step of the way, what data am I working with? I'm curious about how many items are in the selection I've chosen, and what does that data look like? So, so right now, for instance, I'm noticing firstly that we've got this column header, and I think I can see that on my chart here. So I want to get rid of that. I know that's a problem I need to solve. Secondly, I've got all these repeating values. Um, and, and you know, maybe you're okay with that. Uh, in my case, I, I don't need those duplicates. Um, what I want to do is get rid of all the duplicates and only show the unique values. So one comment here from Armin. Um, Armin's helping me out, trying to, trying to show me what formula I need to use. Armin, hopefully I can wow you on this call today, because I actually don't need any of those functions. But let me, let me tell you a little bit. So Armin just gave a quick comment. We, um, so I've got, I've got this data that I've selected, and I've got all this raw data. Um, I know I need to do some things with it, like remove the duplicates, remove this column header. There are two ways for me to accomplish that in Clipfolio. One is to use some of the functions that we make available. So we have functions in Clipfolio similar to what you might see in Excel or Google Sheets or working with a database. They're, they're not an exact mirror. Uh, to, to the Excel functions, uh, but there's a ton of similarity. So things like functions like count or sum or concat uh, or between, um, array, those are, those are going to be very, very similar, if not identical. Uh, but there's this whole library of functions in Clipfolio from simple things like removing duplicates all the way up to quite advanced statistical functions. And this is one of the ways you can use to manipulate raw data in the platform. Um, but over the last quarter or so, we've introduced some fantastic and, and hopefully much simpler ways to accomplish some of these basic tasks. So the first thing I want to do, if you remember, 
Uh, and guys, stop me if, if I'm going too slowly here. Um, just want to make sure we're, we're being thorough. The first thing I want to do is remove this header. So what I want to do is I want to right click on this x-axis and I want to set up a filter. I'm going to filter out any data that I don't want. Um, so maybe I know that I'm only interested in uh, this position or this position. Um, what I actually want to do here is just exclude this column header. So I want to click on the column header and I click exclude and set up this filter. And what I'm saying here is Clipfolio is now going to show me any data in this column except what I've chosen to exclude. Uh, so the way to do that in a function is to use the slice function, um, but hopefully you'll find that that's just not required very often anymore. The next thing I want to do, because we still see our x-axis is very, very crowded, I can't even really read what's happening, I want to remove these duplicates. So I'm going to right-click again and choose to group this data. Group is the function or the, the uh, action we use to remove duplicates. So when I group this, our chart now looks a great deal different. We're just seeing the unique, the four unique values, center, right wing, left wing, and defense. Uh, so our x-axis, I think, looks pretty nice and clean right now. Um, and and a, a very positive piece of this is that I've now done most of the heavy lifting. So if I now want to show some numerical metrics, I can hop over to my series, and maybe I want to showcase the total number of goals scored by each of these positions. So now all I have to do is select column F. Because we've removed all the duplicate values on our x-axis, these numerical values are automatically being aggregated. Um, the default aggregation type is sum, so Clifolio chooses what the default method is. If we want to change it and show something a little bit different, uh, like the average number of goals scored by each of these players it, by position, um, I can choose that aggregation method instead, and our chart will react. I think um, this is a good scenario where I might want to flip this chart on its x-axis just to become a little bit more readable. I've also got access in the properties menu to do things like show or hide the legend. I think this one, I'm only showing one series, so I probably don't need the legend. I might just get rid of it. Maybe I also want to make this chart smaller or larger. Uh, screen real estate is hugely important in a dashboard, um, so just, just making use of these options wherever you, wherever you can. You really only want to give something as much space as it needs. Perfect. So, so what questions are coming to mind based on this so far? So one good question here. Um, so we've chosen to just show one series right now, but a question about um, showing another series and specifically stacking them. Um, so we can we can do that. We can do that as well. So let's see. Let's get our chart back to normal. Sometimes when I'm editing, I sort of prefer to keep it in this view. Um, so right now, you can see up in our table of contents that we've just got this one series. If I want to add another, I see that option in the properties menu. Remember, every piece of our chart is going to have its own properties menu, and there's a lot of um, a lot of a lot of options you've got access to. So I would encourage you to experiment, poke around, and just see some of the visuals that that some of the visual elements you can affect. Um, so I want to add another series here, and as soon as I do that, I can see it reflected in our table of contents. So let's call our first series. Um, I want to rename this, and maybe I will bring back our legend here. So I want to call this first series goals. So now I see that's reflected, and also now whenever I hover over the chart, I see the series label that we've given it here. Our new series, maybe we'll want to call this assists. Um, so we've set up our first series. If we're now editing our second series, we can navigate over to the data tab. Um, and also, because I've, I've done that removing of the duplicates on the x-axis, if I now want to show um, another numerical, numerical element, it's just a matter of choosing that appropriate column. Um, I think what we're finding here is that these numbers are so high that we can almost no longer see our number of goals. Actually, what's happened is because we chose to show the average number of goals, that average is so much lower than the, the total number of assists, 
So let's get, get this back to sum. Now we've got both categories displayed side by side. So the total number of goals scored by this position beside the total number of assists. If we want to now stack these bars together, it's a simple option in our properties menu. So I see the ability to stack all the bars or don't stack the bars. I want to stack them. Now we've got one on top of the other. Now this wasn't necessarily the best data set to show on a stacked bar chart, um, but nonetheless, if my data made more sense to show in this way, I can absolutely do it. I can also choose to, let's see if, there, if it makes sense to do something else. Um, Okay, here's a good use case. So let's say I wanted to show the total number of goals. So we've got that in our first series. Instead of assists, let's say we wanted to show power play goals. So now in green, let's give this a better name. So if you're not a hockey fan, um, a goal is any goal you score, any puck you put in the net, a power play goal is a specific type of goal. Um, this chart right here, I think it might make sense to stack these bars by percentage. Uh, so now I'm seeing all the bars are stacking to 100, um, and the sort of size of this bar indicates the percentage, although I'm not really showing it, uh, the percentage that are regular goals and the percentage that are power play goals. So anyway, tons and tons of visual options. Highly encourage you to experiment in some of these properties menus. So Armin, it looks like you may have dropped off the call. Um, I know I see you back on. What I wanted to show you is that we're able to do all of that um, grouping and filtering uh, and sorting just in our, um, anyway, without using any functions. So no slice, no group, no sort. Um, all I did was I set up a filter to exclude the column header. I applied the group function to remove all these duplicate values. My data seems to be sorted just by coincidence, uh, but if I wanted to sort it in a different way, I can sort this lowest to highest or highest to lowest, and the chart will immediately react to that. So if you haven't found some of these simple ways to manipulate the data, take a look and hopefully you'll find this to be a little bit of an easier route. Let's do something a little bit different now. Um, so let's, let's get rid of our stuff here. And I'm gonna remove some of these filtering options that I've showcased. So any specific questions that are coming to mind for you guys, I'm happy to, to field them. Um, let me know. Okay, so here's a couple questions. Um, so, whenever I select a piece of data from my data source, um, so the question is, where does the sheet one come from? So whenever I select a piece of data from the data source, um, Clipfolio is just calling out where, specifically where the data is coming from. So I, I don't know offhand. I actually don't think there are more than one sheets in this file. There's more than one sheet in this file. So I guess by default, we're just calling this sheet one. Um, this is sort of just telling Clipfolio that I've selected a specific cell, and sheet one is sort of where I'm selecting it from. If there are multiple sheets in your Excel file, um, you would see the name of the specific sheet. This is sort of a pointer for, for the system to where the data is coming from in the data source. Another thing that's, that's worth mentioning is I personally don't um, use it as much as some of my colleagues in development. Um, I'm a, I'm, I tend to be a, I, I prefer using my mouse. So if I want to select data, I'm going to choose column B. Or if I want to select a few cells, I'm going to use my mouse to do it. Um, but you do have the ability to just start typing. Um, and we're, we're giving you a few tips to that right below our formula bar. So I do have the ability to just type the at symbol. Um, start typing the name of the data source. By default, Clipfolio is sort of helping me out, but maybe if I wanted a different sheet, I can start typing that. Um, I'm going to mess up this syntax because I don't use it very often, but anyway, you do have the ability to just use your keyboard to uh, select the specific data instead of using um, the mouse like I tend to prefer. 
Good, good question there. And there's tons of keyboard shortcuts. We'll get into showing you a few others in a moment. Um, so let's say we wanted to do something slightly different. Let's say on our x-axis we wanted to show all of our players. Um, I can see that they're, the names are quite jumbled. Uh, so we would probably want to do some work on this. Um, we'll give ourselves as much space as possible. Let's say we wanted to show all of the players and all of the total games played instead of the goals. Perfect, so right now we're showing that data. Maybe we'll make this chart. Whenever I see this issue that my bars are much smaller than I would hope, um, the, the, root, the, the problem is that I haven't chosen a large enough chart. So if I choose to make this a little bit bigger, now I can view the data a little bit more, a little bit more nicely. Um, so our chart is very jumbled right now. We're showing a ton of data. Um, but let's, let's introduce um, some engagement or some interactivity. So instead of me as the dashboard builder uh, deciding what data our, um, our users are looking at, let's let them make that selection. So I want to pull in a filter in Clipfolio. We call these user input controls. Have you guys experimented much with these? And have you ever tried to build uh, a, a filter into your own dashboards? Cool. OK, so Armin, have you been successful doing that, or did you run into any issues? Nice. OK, so a few of our users have been successful here. Did you do it through, um, through some of the simple ways of, of manipulating data, setting up filters in here, or did you do it um, through some of the formulas, like select and things like that? Gotcha. Okay, so both of you are working with, with formulas. Cool. So, so the reality is that there, there definitely will still be use cases where you're going to need to use things like select and look up and group and group by. Um, where you're doing more complex manipulations, that's where you're running into that. But we can do, we can do a ton, and actually we're seeing improvements to this functionality weekly. Uh, there are items in every one of our development sprints around this where we can do more and more without using any functions at all. So let's see what I'm able to do with this data source. And if maybe this data doesn't support uh, the type of manipulation that I'm looking for, we'll see if we can find some new data. But let's, tr let's try and do it without any functions at all. So right now, our chart is showing every player in my data source and all of their total number of games played. But let's say we want to expose the ability for our users to choose what position of players they're looking at. So maybe they only want to look at defensemen or only want to look at centers. Um, so we've pulled in a user input control. For those of you who have not worked with filters yet, um, the way these work is this. So firstly, I want to, um, this is going to be a drop down list. A filter can be things like a date picker where we can just allow our users to choose a date, maybe a start date and an end date. This is something we cover in depth in our 301 webinar. Um, a filter can be a text field where I just give people the ability to enter some text um, and uh, the clip will react to that. For now, we want to make it a drop down list. So what I want to do is first I want to bring in some data. So I'm going to choose all my data in column C because that's what I want the drop-down list to show. Um, I want to do some basic filtering here. So right now, I'm seeing the column header, and I'm also seeing all these repeating values. So I can do some light filtering here. I'm going to right-click. I want to set up a filter. Actually, let's group this first, just to see how things take effect. Um, so now we've removed all these duplicates. We're just left with unique values. I want to now set up a filter. And I want to exclude this column header. Perfect. So our drop-down list now just has the unique positions in our data source. Um, now, the way these, these filters work in Clipfolio is to the end user, things are very, very simple. They see a drop-down list. They, they almost just, just naturally know what's expected of them. They're supposed to pick an option. 
Um, what happens behind the scenes is that we as dashboard builders assign a variable to this filter. So I see the ability to do that over here. Um, I'm going to create a new variable. So let's call this NHL scoring position. I can't have any spaces in here. <clears throat> and also, I, I often, especially in these demo accounts, uh, put my initials at the start of these so I can more easily identify some of the variables that I've created. Um, this clip editor value is not required, but it's helpful for, for troubleshooting purposes. So I will make this, I want to make it one of the potential options that this variable can have. So I create this variable, and now what happens is whatever option a user chooses, um, that, that selection is going to be temporarily assigned to this variable, ZK NHL scoring data. And what that allows us to do is use this variable in our chart. So right now we have not done that yet. We've not linked our variable to our chart. So I can make all the selections in the world up here, and nothing's happening down here. The way I want to incorporate this into the chart is by, by building a filter. But let's think about this. So our chart right now is showing us two things. There's two data points. I've got the names of all my players, and I've got the total number of games played by each of those players. Um, neither of those data points have anything to do with position. So I need to find a way to use this information. I want to use the knowledge uh, or the intelligence or the data that, that my users are choosing. I want to use that somewhere in my chart, but I don't have any real need to show that. Um, I don't want my chart anywhere to say left wing or center. So what I can do is in my bar chart, uh, I want to do what's called, I want to use what we call in Clipfolio hidden data. Um, this is sort of like a hidden column in a table. It effectively gives me the ability to use some data in the chart, use that data, but not show it. So I've added that hidden data element, and I see it up in my table of contents. I want to now choose this data, all the positions. And here's where I'm going to set up my filter. So I'm going to set up a filter that says, um, you know, I can't just use this member, this pick list. I want to actually set up a condition that says, show me all the data in my hidden data. I haven't given it a good name. I apologize. Um, but show me all the data that matches. And instead of typing something in, I want to choose this other button because the data that I want to match is my variable. So if I just type ZK, it'll get me down to my list of variables. Here's the variable we created, and this is what my filter needs to be based on. I want to see only the data, or my, my hidden data should reflect only the elements that match my variable. And if you recall, basically what I'm doing is saying only match the data that, that reflects what our user has chosen in the filter. And as soon as I apply this, now our chart will react to it. So if we're choosing left wing, our chart is only showing that info. If we choose center, our chart reacts to that. Um, a really nice thing we can do, and, and um, Elvin and Armin, if you guys you know, built some of these uh, variables uh, in the past using, using formulas, I don't know if you ever went through the, through the, through the example of including all in your drop-down list, but in fairness, that was quite complicated, um, and it was something that there was, you know, uh, required in a lot of cases. So now we can do that really easily with the click of a button. Um, if I say include the option of all in my drop-down list, it's just this checkbox, and now that appears right here at the top of my of my uh, drop-down. So if I want to show all, this will make our chart a little bit crowded. Well, let's see, I may have taken a little misstep here. I wonder. I may have, may, may have to do something else to uh, set that properly. Um, no, there we go. Okay, we just took a second to catch up. So if I want to show all, in this case, our chart is a little bit crowded and actually a little bit unreadable. Um, 
hopefully you'll find this, this option useful for you guys. Much, much simpler, just a real simple checkbox. Um, and our, our filter here is quite simple. So right now we're just looking for one dropdown. Um, however, we, we can include multiple dropdowns. Um, I don't know if I have got time to fully set it up and, and sort of do it in a way that explains what I'm doing, but if I wanted to incorporate a second and a third dropdown, um, I can incorporate those into my chart as well, and we have not used a single function to set this up. If you get into working with dates and date pickers, we've got some phenomenal functionality on the roadmap um, currently, currently in QA, and actually we're currently testing some of it internally, not yet rolled live. Until it's rolled live, if you're working with dates in some of your filters, you do still need some functions. And like I mentioned, um, you know, if you're building complex, complex uh, clips with, with more uh, complicated logic and maybe combining data from a few different sources, there absolutely will be occasions where you need functions. But hopefully, in some of the simpler use cases and especially getting started, you can do it in, uh, in some of these simpler ways. So we call this aggregated data. Um, Back to our YouTube channel, there's a, there's a playlist I love on this topic as well. It is called More Actions and Additional Data. Um, and you know, before we end the call today, um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you our help center and we'll, we'll make sure you understand where to find support on any questions you run into um, and all the resources you have available to you. We're, we're really investing in training and learning um, and, and we want to be as helpful as possible because there is com complexity to working in Clipfolio. I have always found that I, I, you know, you can show me a perfect document um, with all the information I need. It's almost a personal preference. I, I just find videos are a little bit more helpful and when I see it in practice, I can follow along and if I, if I can follow along successfully and, and build it myself, um, that's sort of how I tend to prefer to learn. So anyway, I gravitate to some of the content on our YouTube channel, and this one in particular is a great playlist. Really short, easily consumable videos. I just put that in the chat menu as well. So some good questions here. Uh, let's go back to our clip editor. Can we go back to the hidden data? Sure. So, so the way I set this up was um, I first clicked on bar and line chart. And you know, let's pretend we were working with a table instead of a chart. So if I just pull a table down here, if I ever want to incorporate hidden data, I'm always going to find it in the properties menu for the top level of whatever I'm doing. So if I click on table or if I click on bar chart, here's where I find the option to add hidden data. So that was the first step that I took. As soon as I did that, so let's, let's say we, we wanted to do it again. As soon as I click add hidden data, I just a new hidden data section just appeared in my chart. This is what I would do if I was incorporating a second condition. Uh, let's remove it for now. So as soon as I said add hidden data, it appeared right here. Um, I should have given it a better name so it would look better when I was setting up my condition. So let's call this position. Uh, the next thing I did was I populated this hidden data with the required info. So again, you know, the reason we wanted to do this is because, let's see if we can get this all visible on one screen. The reason I, I needed to take this route was because our, our end users were choosing this data point, this, this position. Um, and this is the position that our NHL players play. Um, so they're choosing this data point, but my chart is just showing me games and the players' names. So in other words, it's not showing me any data on position. So I needed a way to use this information without showing it on the chart. And hidden data is the way we did that. So we added the hidden data, we populated it with the required data that, our, our, that we needed, that really our, our variable was using. And the final step was we created a filter. Uh, we created a condition and basically said the hidden data on our position needs to match 
And if I was doing something slightly different, maybe I would say need to, needs to contain or needs to not match. In our case, it was needs to match. Um, and here, I was able to choose the specific variable that our drop-down list is using. Um, a quick note on this. So the items in this drop-down, uh, you know, does it match, does it contain, begins with, so on. That is based on, Clipfolio tries to interpret, um, we try to auto-detect what data, what type of data you're working with. Is it text, is it a number, a date and time, and so on. So if you ever uh, get into the position where you're, you're in this section and some of the options you're seeing in Clipfolio, maybe some of the properties menu options, are just not quite aligning, um, one, of the, one of the first things I would do to troubleshoot is make sure that we have correctly identified what type of information you're working with. Um, if we've incorrectly assumed you're working with a number, then the options you would see in this filter are going to be different. They're going to be based on numerical values. Does it equal? Is it greater than or less than? And that's, that's wrong. Um, so the problem is just that I need to flip it back and say I'm working with text data. And at that point, the option should make a little bit more sense. So good question here. Um, will there be on-site training for customers to come in face-to-face? -face? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, we're based in Ottawa, Canada. We do frequently uh, host customers at our office. They're generally local customers. Um, if you're interested in that, happy to chat and find a way to help out. Generally though, and I would say 99% of the training we're offering and the training we're investing in is, um, is one to many. So we do webinars like this a few times a week. We're actually working on a really exciting new webinar series, so watch for that and we will we'll communicate that to, um, to our customer base and, and potential customers as soon as, as we roll that out live. Um, sort of on-demand content that's on our YouTube channel, things like that. So we don't do a lot of face-to-face -face content or face-to-face -face training, but to, if you're interested, happy to chat more and see how we can help out. Great, great question. So we've looked at our YouTube channel. Um, let's spend the last couple minutes. I want to make sure you guys understand some of the resources you have access to to get help in Clipfolio. And the first I would call out, and the most important by far, is our help center. So you'll find this at support.clipfolio.com. Our help center is something we're putting a huge, huge, uh, huge, huge efforts into. Um, I can search for anything by keyword. So let's say I'm not so clear on how to set up the variable that I'm looking for, and, and that's what I'm interested in. I search for that keyword, and I'm seeing two things immediately. Um, articles on this side that are appearing in our knowledge base these are some of the internal guides that we've put together, uh, detailed documents, many contain videos um, that will hopefully give you the, the data that you're, or the info that you're looking for. Tons and tons of articles on a wide variety of topics, all searchable by keyword. What we're seeing on this other side are posts from our community. Uh, so our, our customer and partner community, so that's also on our help center. You can see it over here and you guys can post any ideas, post any questions. Really, really active forum, and we're, we're putting a ton of effort into here, too. So you can see side-by-side uh, -side articles from our knowledge base, and then maybe some tips and tricks from our customers and our partners. We're commenting and we're contributing to these threads as well. So a ton of content available to you. You also have the ability to submit a ticket. So all Clipfolio customers um, and anyone evaluating Clipfolio has full access to our support team. We don't sort of productize. Um, Tickets, there's no limit or to, to how many tickets you can raise, and we want to help as much as we can. Where we draw the line is we're not going to be able to create the content for you. Sometimes early on, the quickest way to do things is, is to set up an example, and we're happy to do that. Uh, but, but typically, we can't create content for you through a support ticket, but we're happy to field any questions, and we will always do our best to point you in the right direction. So definitely take us up, up on that offer. You can create a ticket right here, or you can email support at clipfolio.com, which will create a ticket. And then live chat. Uh, you will see the live chat in our help center and on our website, support or our website, clipfolio.com. Um, 
we are uh, so our entire success team is is on the live chat for close to 18 hours a day. Um, so we're we're on it out of our uh, headquarters in Ottawa. We also have a remote team providing after hours support. So this is another great way to start a conversation with us. We will, um, you know, unfortunately, just in the interest of time, really not be able to solve every question over chat. But as a means of getting in touch, it's a great way to start. So definitely reach out, let us know what we can do, and we will do our absolute best. I've left it till the very end, um, but if there's any other questions that anyone has, let me know and I will do my best to help. You'll also get a quick follow-up from me. Um, the recording on that one will be a little bit out of date. Uh, we're going to get this today's recording up hosted online uh, shortly, so you should see that on our webinars page soon. And then maybe while you're thinking or if you have any questions and you're busy typing them out, um, this was our 201 session. You can find and register for any upcoming webinars at clipfolio.com slash resources slash webinars.